Oh. And, thank, and thank the speaker again. <laughs> we, we are very pleased to have Paul Feehan give this instance of gauge theory virtual. You know, we'll be talking about Morse bot theory. Okay, well, thank you, Dave and Danny and uh, everybody for uh, uh, invitation and, and joining. So, uh, Nikolai, so th thank you all. Um, all right, so um, this is the, uh, the outline. Um, so I'll, I'll give a, first of all, just a, an overview of, you know, what the, what the talk uh, is about. Um, then I'm going to uh, talk about something classical and a, a Fra so-called Frankel's theorem. I'll explain what that is and an enhancement uh, of that. Uh, then I'll, I'll explain this notion of virtual uh, Morse bot index uh, and what it's, uh, it's good for. Um, and then uh, uh, there's going to be up until this point here, section four, uh, there won't be any gauge theory, uh, but then we're going to apply these techniques to, um, to a problem in, in, in gauge theory and topology of four manifolds. So I'll introduce some of the, the concepts we'll have there. Um, and then in, in section five, I'll, I'll sort of, you know, phrase the, uh, uh, the basic idea of a program that, that Tom and Ness uh, and I are working on. Um, so this is joint, all joint work uh, with him. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll describe, you know, some of our, uh, some of our results. And I, I, I know I'm not going to get to it, but um, we have a lot of pictures in our paper. I'll give you the reference to the paper and the, the archive. So I kind of gathered them all in this appendix because they explain uh, using pictures, some of the ideas uh, probably in, in a way that's, that's uh, more informative, uh, even though the examples are simple, uh, that's, that's more meaningful than any kind of word or written explanation uh, I can give. So um, uh, if there's time at the end and somebody wants to ask me about it, I can, I can go over this uh, appendix as well. All right, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is joint work with Tom LNS. Uh, it's based on our uh, paper uh, on the archive. All right, so I'm gonna talk about a, a new uh, idea in, in Morse bot theory, which we call virtual Morse bot theory for, for reasons that will become uh, apparent. And the, the new feature is that it, it applies to singular, um, singular analytic spaces that typically arise in gauge theory, although uh, the basic ideas apply to any singular space. We like analytic spaces for reasons that um, I'll explain, I'll explain later why, why that's important. But e examples of these moduli spaces that arise in, in gauge theory, uh, the primary one that we're interested in is the space of SSD monopoles over closed four manifolds, a cyber with simple type. Uh, another common and closely related example is that of so-called stable holomorphic pairs of bundles and sections over uh, closed uh, killer surfaces. And the, the classical paradigm that uh, Studer Hitchin goes back to uh, late 1980s is the moduli space of Higgs pairs over closed uh, Riemann surfaces. So the first two moduli spaces in general, they have singularities. And the third example here, that of Higgs pairs, it you know, can have singularities too, but there are nice criteria that Hitchin uh, used in his paper. Uh, that, uh, you know, at, at least apply in, in many interesting cases that these moduli spaces are smooth. So in that case, you know, classical methods of Morse 3 applied. So these moduli spaces over, when we restrict SSD monopoles to killer surfaces, uh, we consider Higgs pairs over, over Riemann surfaces. These are, these are complex analytic spaces and they have uh, their own killer metrics and they also have nice Hamiltonian uh, circle actions. So if we have a, a four manifold, a, a smooth four manifold, just is only almost Hermitian, uh, and that, that class includes four manifolds of cyber witness simple type, uh, that, that means that the almost complex structure is, is first of all, it's not necessarily integrable. And it's a fundamental two form, which is defined by the almost complex structure and the Riemannian metric, and that need not, be, need not be closed. If it is closed, then you've got a, a symplectic manifold. Um, so even in this almost Hermitian setting, um, we can still show that the, the moduli space of SOC monopoles, it's, it's a real analytic space. 
Uh, and then there's some additional work uh, involved in showing that it's actually almost almost Hermitian. The fundamental two form is non-degenerate. Well, um, sorry, question? Yeah. Yeah, that's for me. Um, is there some simple um, explanation of why simple the cyber and simple type would um, get you this? I mean, I guess you haven't actually defined it, but uh, but um, get you this almost termination. Um, Oh, um, yeah. So um, the, the basic thing is, is getting the almost uh, complex uh, structure. So um, uh, the, that's, a, that, that's essentially a, a consequence of the dimension formula for the dimension of this uh, cyber width and moduli space. I see. So, so lots of formula. You're, you're just saying it's almost complex uh, or well and it's something else. Um, I'm saying it's it's almost complex, and there's a, a compatible Riemannian metric. So that's what I'm calling almost Hermitian. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So um, so moduli spaces vested between monopoles carry circle actions. The circle actions um, the circle action comes from just multiplying the spinner by by uh, by a scalar. And uh, and that's, that's compatible with the complex structure, almost complex structure and, and Romanian metric. Uh, and that there's also an associated Hamiltonian function for that circle action. And it, it's that Hamiltonian function to which, you know, uh, virtual uh, Morse bond theory at least uh, applies in, in its most useful, most useful setting. So the, the reason that we're, we're interested in, in studying all of this uh, is because of the following uh, conjecture. Um, so it uh, goes uh, as follows. It's stated a little bit more more commonly for symplectic uh, manifolds, but uh, so this is a you know a, a slight generalization uh, of that. So if we have a, a closed oriented four manifold with b1 equals zero and odd b plus uh, bigger than or equal to three, and, and the four manifold is cyber width and simple type, and there's a non-zero cyber width invariant, uh, then this inequality holds. Now uh, this Inequality is, is the uh, BM, BMY or Bogomolov Miyayoka Yao inequality. It, it's sometimes written just, I'll, I'll say, in this form here. This is the way complex algebraic geometry is well, we'll typically, typically write it. It was, it was proved independently by, uh, by Yao back in the late, uh, late, late 70s uh, using methods of, of differential geometry and PDEs. Uh, and it was, was proved about the same time independently by, by uh, Miyayoka using algebraic geometry methods. And um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, a, due to, it's a result of, of Klopp-Taubes that symplectic four manifolds um, uh, have cyber with simple types, so they, they satisfy the conjecture. The, you know, these are the hypothesis of this conjecture. This con so this conjecture is a you know, slight generalization of one that's commonly stated for symplectic uh, four manifolds. All right, so I'm going to e explain in the middle of the talk uh, what SOT monopoles have to do with this. But let me begin with um, an old theorem, uh, uh, a small generalization of it due to Frankel that goes back to uh, 59 uh, or, or so. Uh, and it was first probably most famously used by, by Hitchin in his uh, late 80s paper, the so-called self-duality equations uh, on the Riemann surface. All right, so the, the version of Frankel's theorem that we're going to um, uh, going to state is, is a little bit more general than, than Frankel's original one. Um, we're going to, as Frankel did, he didn't, he, most of his paper is, is written under the assumption that the almost complex structure is, is integrable. Um, but uh, so he, he phrased it in terms of Kähler manifolds and then as an aside said, well, his results uh, also held for, for symplectic manifolds. Um, we're also going to drop uh, the requirement that the fundamental two form uh, be closed. So that's, uh, that's the only uh, difference in, in our statement of Frankel's, Frankel's theorem. And you just have to go through his paper and, and, and check that his, his main results uh, still hold. So if you, an almost complex structure, if you, you don't remember, it's just a, an endomorphism of the tangent bundle that satisfies this, uh, this identity. And uh, just saying that, that the Riemannian metric and almost complex structure 
are compatible uh, just means that this that you have this orthogonality relationship. All right. So, what is Frankel's theorem, or, or you know, our, our tiny generalization of it? Uh, I would say. So it, it's a little bit of a, a mouthful, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to read it. Any, any, anybody who is, is welcome to have a copy of these slides um, afterwards. I'm happy to share them. Um, uh, so the, the setup is that you have a, a closed closed manifold, smooth, um, has a Riemannian metric, uh, almost complex structure. They're compatible. Um, there's a fundamental two form omega defined by the metric and the almost complex structure. Uh, and you have a compatible uh, circle action. And in particular, you also assume that this circle action is, is Hamiltonian in the sense that there's some function, smooth function f, such that uh, df is this interior product of the um, fundamental two form omega and the generator of the, of the circle action uh, x. All right, so what is that, uh, what is that by you? Well, Sir so Frankel was concerned with um, examining the critical points of these Hamiltonian functions and trying to interpret them uh, in terms of the circle actions. Uh, and he has, uh, you know, the following uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful results. You know. So first of all, if, if P is a, is a critical point of this Hamiltonian function, that's equivalently, that's a fixed point of the circle action. So in that situation, uh, first of all, the, the function F is, is um, is Morse bot at this at this point. You know the critical set uh, is uh, in the neighborhood of that point. It's a smooth set manifold. Um, its tangent space uh, at that critical point is equal to the curl kernel of the, of the Hessian of the uh, the function f. And in particular, he gives a you know a way of, of calculating the the Morse index, uh, which is you know through this this first bullet. So the the eigenvalues of the Hessian are equal to the weights of the circle action on, on, the, on the tangent space. And it's, it's also just a consequence, the setup that the, you know, each, the critical set is even dimension, even, even co-dimension. So the, the value of this for, um, for Morse theory is, uh, is, the, is the following, that um, uh, you know, the subspace in which the, the Hessian is, is negative Definite, you know, so by definition, that's the, the you know the Morse index um, of the function f. Um, that's equal to the subspace in which the circle acts with with negative negative weight. And here, uh, we're just defining you know the gradient vector field, uh, sorry, in particular the Hessian, uh, just in the uh, you know various ways of defining it. Uh, but here, just in terms of the, the gradient vector field and, and the Levy Chebyshev uh, connection act acting on that. So here, I just uh, I'm just reminding you that if you forget that the you know the classical Morse bot index uh, of f at the critical point is equal to the dimension of the uh, subspace in which um, um, either the Hessian uh, is negative definite or here thanks to Frankel in which the circle acts with with negative weight. So this is the the theorem that um, Hitchin famously used uh, in his, his paper back in the 80s on the moduli space of Higgs pairs. And it's, it's this theorem that we want in turn uh, to apply to the moduli space of SLC monopoles. And I'll explain that uh, application during the talk. Okay, so let's just go back to the very beginning of the statement of Frankel's theorem where we say, you know, let this, let M be a smooth, finite dimensional, um, almost Hermitian manifold, but the, you know, sticking point is smooth. So if we take something like the moduli space of Higgs pairs, there are, on a Riemann surface, there are mild, or there at least there are clear criteria for when uh, you can state to give you a smooth moduli space. So the, um, so the rank and the degree of the vector bundle over the Riemann surface of those are co-prime, um, then um, you'll have a smooth moduli space. So Hitchin in his paper takes um, a rank two bundle and he assumes odd degree. So he, if that condition is fulfilled in, in his paper. However, if you try to apply this Frankel theorem to something like the moduli space of SST monopoles, um, then the most interesting points in the moduli space, so either Cyber-Witten monopoles um, or the other ones we're gonna focus on, 
uh, they are, are not smooth points uh, of the moduli space, and the Frankel theorem doesn't apply. So what can you, uh, what can you do about that? So that um, led us to think about uh, an alternative to Morse spot index for Hamiltonian functions of circle actions on, on spaces which are not smooth. Uh, and we're most, the most general kind of space that's reasonable to think about are so-called analytic spaces. Uh, which are locally just, um, you know, sub-varieties of um, Euclidean space or, or n-dimensional complex space. So in, in, in Hitchens' application of, um, of Frankelson, um, uh, he used it to, first of all, say something about the dimension of the critical set manifolds, in particular the, the Morse indices of a, a very natural Hamiltonian function. I'll, I'll tell you what that Hamiltonian function is a little bit later. Uh, it's the same one for SO3 monopoles, essentially as it was for Higgs pairs. Uh, and he also used it to, you know, uh, obtain many results about the topology of the moduli space of Higgs bundles. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a very powerful uh, tool when you, when you can apply it. Uh, and one of our, our goals is to see, well, how can you generalize at least some aspect of it to analytic spaces, which are, which are singular? So I'm going to state two, um, two versions of the a more, what I call a virtual more spot index theorem. One, just because it's, it's simpler, and uh, even though it's not the one we ultimately apply, it, it doesn't have any circle actions uh, involved. And then a, a second version, uh, which is the one we actually use, where there's a circle action. But the first version is a little bit, uh, a little bit shorter and easier to explain. So I'll, I'll, I'll state that first. So we're given, first of all, a, a, a X here is, we think about this as being like an ambient real analytic manifold. And M is, is some real analytic subspace of that. And you can think about it as just being a, a real analytic subvariety. And uh, we pick a, a point in this uh, subvariety. And uh, because this is a, a real analytic space, there's a local defining function. And uh, well, this is this, this function, uh, this map F. And then the, the, the risky tangent space 2M, this analytic space at that point, is just a, you know, the kernel of the differential of this local defining function. So we're also going to give ourselves a function little f on the ambient ma analytic manifold X. Uh, I'm going to uh, assume that uh, P, uh, this function F, is, is, is Morse bot at this, this point in, in the following sense. So we're going to ask for, for two things. First of all, that the, the critical set defined in this way, where the, the kernel of, of the differential of little f is equal to the Zariski tangent space, that this is a, a real analytic set manifold. Uh, and also so that the, the tangent space to the critical set at this point P, that's the kernel of, 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 the, of the Hessian. So these, these conditions are, are, are set up because uh, these are, are ones uh, to which um, uh, the moduli space of SLT monopoles gives a, a natural example of this kind of setup. So we're further going to um, split up the Zariski tangent space into two, into two parts, just as we do a wood in, in classical Morse, uh, Morse, Morse, Morse theory. Uh, the maximal positive and negative real subspaces for the Hessian. And then we're going to define what we call a, a virtual Morse bot index, which is this quantity here. So the usual Morse bot index uh, would simply be, um, uh, would simply be the, the first term here, the, the kernel of the dimension in which um, uh, the Hessian matrix is um, uh, uh, negative definite. Um, uh, we're going to subtract off the dimension of the co-kernel of this function as well. So if this quantity is, is positive, uh, then the conclusion is this point P is not, not a local minimum. So if, if P happens to be a smooth point, uh, then this second term is zero. So the co-kernel of this local defining function, it's, it's measuring precisely the extent to which the, the P is a, is a singular point. So if P is a smooth point, uh, then this term disappears and this lambda P minus is just a classical Morse index. Is that meant to be um, capital F or lowercase f in equation two? 
and uh, it's um, uh, a, a capital F. You know, so it, it's best maybe just to um, you know, uh, I, I probably should have just replaced this quantity here by the um, uh, uh, the, the negative the the, um, uh, the, oh, the maximal okay. negative real subspace uh, for for the Hessian matrix. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay, so if we have a, a circle action, we can we can refine this a, a little bit more. Uh, so we, it's it's going to be easier to make this quantity positive, which is for reasons we'll see later, uh, which is what we're interested in. Uh, if we can make this quantity we're we're subtracting off smaller. So when we have a circle action, um, roughly speaking, that gives us a way of making this quantity smaller. All right, so let's suppose we have a circle action. Um, and then for just to make the, you know, this is already lengthy theorem statement, just to make it a little bit shorter and more compact, I'm going to assume up front that we have a, a, a Kähler, a complex Kähler um, manifold X, um, rather than talk about a, you know, a real analytic Manifolds with an almost complex structure, Mannian metric, and a, you know, and so on, uh, which which I, which which we could do. But but just for the purposes of exposition, it just makes it easier. We just assume upfront that this Abbey manifold X is, is is complex Kähler. In applications, we don't want to necessarily do that. All right. So we again um, we have a we have a circle action now, which is assumed to be Hamiltonian with some Hamiltonian function f. So little f will be our, or well, is going to play the role of our, of our Morse function. The Hamiltonian function is going to play the role of our Morse function. Little omega, this is the Kala form. Uh, C here is the generator of the circle action. And inside of this nice complex manifold x, there is a, a closed complex analytic subspace. And again, I'm going to fix the point, fix the local, local defining function, this local defining function allows us to define at least an, an extrinsic um, Zariski tangent space, which is defined here. And, and just because this is, you know, the tradition in, in gauge theory, uh, which is where we're going to apply this, uh, I'm going to call this Zariski tangent space H1. And the uh, orthogonal complement, or the co kernel if you will, of the differential of capital of F, I call that H2. So this is the obstruction to the point P being a, a, a smooth a smooth point. And we can also um, define a space, uh, a submanifold M mirror, uh, whose tangent space at the point P is precisely the, the, risky, uh, the risky tangent space. So this is a, a complex uh, Kähler submanifold uh, as defined uh, as here. All right, so we, we again define a notion of critical point, which is appropriate for, uh, for singular points of, of analytic spaces. So we're going to call P a singular point um, if this kernel is equal to the Zariski tangent space. And it's, um, that's also a fixed point of, of the circle action. That's a, another way. That, so that's a, a way which sometimes algebraic geometers, you know, think about Morse theory uh, on, uh, on um, uh, algebraic varieties in terms of, you know, fixed points of, of, of circle actions. So we're going to assume that um, the set of fixed points, at least near P, is a, um, uh, is a complex analytic submanifold. And then we're going to um, split these spaces H1 and H2 into subspaces in which the circle acts with negative weight. Uh, and, and lastly, we define this quantity that what we call the virtual Morse, uh, Morse spot index. And we can think about uh, this first piece here as being representing uh, the classical Morse spot index if the point P was a smooth point. So if the point P is a smooth point, this second uh, piece, uh, this second term disappears and you just have classical Morse spot index. Um, but if, uh, if we have the singular point, uh, this is the way we define the virtual Morse spot index. And the, the utility, the, the, the purpose of the definition is if this quantity is positive, then we can show uh, to this point, V is not a local, not a local minimum. 
Um, the reason why this is a refinement of the, the previous virtual Bohr spot index theorem is that we're, we're subtracting off a quantity here, which in general is going to be smaller than what we subtracted off before. Uh, and again, you know, why we are so concerned about it's showing that certain points are not local minima, and that will become, you know, clear uh, during the talk. At least I hope it will. All right, so um, these theorems, uh, the, the reason why we're restricting our attention to analytic spaces is because it, it makes life easier uh, if we can apply resolution of singularities, and we can do that for um, analytic spaces. And the other ingredients uh, that go into uh, the proofs of these theorems is certain uh, what I call, you know, um, generic perturbation and, and transversality arguments. So ideas imported from um, more standard differential topology. So the, um, so the details of the proof are, are, in, our, are, in, are in our paper. Um, so it, it's, it's not, not stated in this talk, but there is a, a generalization um, of this theorem to a case where um, X is um, the ambient manifold X is, is actually just, it's not complex and it's not complex Keller, it's just seems to be a real analytic almost Hermitian manifold. Um, just to, you know, for the sake of making this talk not too long, uh, I'm going to restrict to the case of, you know, complex Keller uh, manifolds, where the ambient manifold X is complex Keller. Okay, so <clears throat> To apply this to, to gauge theory, um, let me introduce very quickly just some of the ingredients that we're going to need. Um, we, we had these quantities in the statement of the, you know, what my, I might call the topologist statement of the Bo Bogomolov mediocre Yao inequality, uh, C1 squared, and the so called holomorphic Euler characteristic, you know, just expressed here in terms of, you know, standard Betty numbers uh, of a, of a um, topological four manifold. Uh, and it, it makes life easier if we just restrict our attention to four manifolds, which are always have these nice attributes. They're closed, connected, oriented, smooth. They have odd um, B plus bigger than or equal to three and B one equals zero. Um, so these this setup is, is, is important when we eventually uh, appeal to results in cyber equipment theory. Um, I can't explain in a, you know, and in our talk, what cybert witten uh, invariants are, and, and I won't try, um, I'll, I'll simply say that they are um, numbers which are attached to, to spin C structures, and everybody here is at least somewhat familiar with them. So the cybert witten invariant is simply defined by counting points in the moduli space of solutions to the cybert witten equations, uh, at least when the moduli space is, is zero dimensional. Uh, we'll also have to consider the case where our moduli spaces are, are positive dimensional. Um, uh, and then we won't have to compute cyber witten invariants in that case. Um, by definition of a simple type, those invariants are zero. Uh, but we do have to consider the possibility of positive dimensional cyber witten moduli spaces. The next, um, and just a little bit of um, uh, as everybody knows, all standard four manifolds are at least conjecturally of simple type. It's not, not known. All right, so the, the other uh, ingredients which are gonna play an important role are anti-self dual connections. And again, I, I won't try to explain uh, what those are um, uh, exactly, but you know, simply say that um, this space here, the moduli space of anti-self dual equations, uh, this is the set of solutions modular gauge equivalents of this, this equation, where here is a connection uh, on the bundle E, a unitary bundle, FA plus is its curvature. Uh, the zero means we're taking the trace free part of that. Um, so you can think about this as the saying that the self dual part of the curvature on an SO3 bundle, um, that's, uh, that's zero. So that's, those are the anti-self dual connections that we're considering. And it's long been known um, that uh, these are these spaces are, are, are oriented. Uh, they're smooth manifolds, at least for generic metrics, thanks to the free Dulenbeck generic metrics theorem. Um, so usually, this this point about generic metrics is just you know um, it's always said, and and 
not always uh, something we want to emphasize, but uh, it happens for reasons we'll, we'll see uh, in this talk uh, to play an important role. Uh, and um, I'll point that out when we, when we get to it. All right, so the, the objects, which many of you know that tie cyber witten monopoles and now to cell dual connections together, uh, is, the, is the moduli space of SLT monopoles that uh, Tom and I have, have studied for, uh, for a long time. Um, and they're, they're, they're defined using essentially a sum of the ingredients that we use for defining cyber width monopoles on the one hand and anti self dual connections uh, on the other hand. So we, we call um, a pair of a, a connection and a spinner V and SO3 monopole uh, if, they, if they solve this, this equation. So it's, it's, a, it's a, coupled, a pair of coupled equations that are formally very similar looking to the, the cyber witten monopole equations. Um, I'll mention as an aside that they are formally very similar also uh, in, in appearance to the, the, the equations for, for a Higgs pair that, that Hitchin studied in his paper back in the, back in the 80s. You know, the sections V have a different meaning in his, in his paper. Here, uh, DA, this is the Dirac operator defined by the connection A and the levy Chivita connection. And then this is just simply a, you know, a quadratic combination uh, of the spinner. So we have an SO3 monopole if they solve this, this equation. As usual, using gauge equivalents, we can form uh, a moduli space of them. Um, so the moduli space MT is just a set of all pairs modulo gauge equivalence and, and missing a, a gauge equivalence sign there. And what's significant about this space, you know, the reason that it was uh, at first uh, with, with study by Pistogratch and Turin back in 1994 or so, uh, is that it decomposes into disjoint, uh, disjoint subsets. So we have a subspace here in the middle where, the, where if the section is identically zero, what happens? Well, we just have anti-cell dual equations. We just have the anti-cell dual equation. This part becomes vacuous, this part disappears. And the more subtle subspace is when occurs when the connections are reducible. And then this, subs, this subspace, as one can show, it, it, it's equal to a, a union of, of cyber witten moduli spaces where the spin C structures um, vary over, over some range. And then the, you know, the complement, you know, the star here means connection not reducible. Uh, the zero here means spinner not identically zero. Uh, this is the so-called uh, subspace of irreducible non-zero section pairs. And it's a, uh, a result of um, Andre Talman and then myself that um, this is a, a for gener is for generic geometric um, uh, perturbations, this is a smooth manifold. All right, so this, these um, moduli spaces, you know, fit together in this uh, in this picture, where uh, just for the sake of illustration, I've, I've you know got four uh, moduli subspaces of cyber witten monopoles in, in the picture. Uh, presumably, they're all points according to the way the picture is, is drawn. You can think about this picture as being you know in any uh, uh, something of any dimension in in the ambient manifold of, of space of any dimension. At the bottom, here we have the moduli space of anti-self dual connections, and then in the middle, in interpolating between them, we have this space uh, which I highlighted uh, here, mt star zero, which is the moduli space of you know um, irreducible non-zero section pairs. So, Paul, uh, is, is that picture accurate? Is the um, can it be that the moduli space of Instantons is, has a larger dimension than the moduli space of SO3 monopoles? Um, it can, but mod, not, in the, uh, not in the situation that we're going to, um, you know, be not necessarily in the situation we're going to be concerned with. In, in general, it could, yeah, you, you could have, you know, it's not supposed to be dimensionally accurate. No. So the, the, the feature that, you know, where, uh, I will come back to this picture, you know, several times during the talk, but I'll just mention for now that uh, uh, if we were to picture this as being, you know, some kind of, you know, surface in three-dimensional space and, and, you know, this uh, Hamiltonian function I've mentioned a few times as being kind of morally speaking, the height function, 
um, then it looks like, according to the way I've drawn the picture, that this moduli space of ASD connections, this is the absolute minimum. Um, you know, the, and these uh, cyber witten moduli spaces are, are the, the critical points. So here, um, a critical point in, in the usual sense. Here, the moduli space looks like it's, it's, it's singular. Also here, here it looks like we have a smooth saddle point. And the reason for my drawing the picture in this particular way, uh, well, we'll come back to. It. All right, so <clears throat> um, the reason why, another reason why this decomposition is important is, is that it, it's also, um, you know, expressed by the fact that these special subspaces are, are fixed points uh, of a circle action. So we have um, pairs where the section is identically zero. Uh, those are fixed points of the circle action. Uh, the other fixed points of the circle action occur precisely uh, when the connection A is reducible. Uh, and then um, uh, there's a, you know, a bijection, there are bijections which you can, you can write down easily between uh, the subspace where the section is zero and the moduli space of anti self dual connections and the subsets, subsets where the connection A is reducible with respect to some splitting and then a, a certain moduli space of, of cyber written monopoles where the spin C structure is varying just according to how the connection A actually splits. Um, I won't focus on it on this talk, but I'll just mention as an aside that you know many of you know that the complications in um, using moduli spaces of anti self dual connections or SO3 monopoles more generally uh, is that they're, they're non compact uh, due to energy bubbling. Now they all admit uh, Ulenbeck compactifications, and um, you know there are complications due to that non-compactness. Uh, so this is something that we we talk about in our papers, uh, but um, I, I won't talk about it uh, at least at least today. All right, so let me try to explain how we can how one might use the moduli space of SST monopoles to say something about the uh, uh, bokemol of uh, mediocre yao inequality. All right, so the, um, it's well known that the you know, so-called expected you know, dimension, you know, whether or not it's a smooth moduli space, in other words, whether or not their metric G is generic, the so-called expected dimension of this moduli space is given by this formula. So here P1 is the first Pongiasian number of this SOT bundle, E is a you know, rank two Hermitian bundle. Uh, these are you know, uh, skew Hermitian traceless endomorphisms of that bundle. Uh, chi sub H, you know, the holomorphic oral characteristic, oral characteristic, which I defined earlier in terms of just you know, Betty numbers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when, when G is, is generic, uh, then it, it's known that this is a smooth manifold, you know, at least if it's, if it's not empty, which we don't necessarily know a priori and which is also important as well, so we'll see. So let's suppose now that we throw in, you know, an extra ingredient. So let's suppose that the, uh, in this setup, that this first Pontiagian number is, um, it's constrained by a basic, low, what we call a basic lower bound that satisfies this inequality term. So we're going to be interested in, in studying the non-emptiness or otherwise of this moduli space of anti-self dual connections when the first, first Pontiagian number obeys this bound. And we're interested in trying to see, can we use you know, cyber witten theory, in particular, the existence of a spin C structure on a four manifold with a, with a non-zero invariant uh, to show that this moduli space is non-empty. All right, so let's, let's suppose that, um, leaving that question aside, let's suppose that uh, we do know when this inequality holds that this moduli space, you know, does admit some ASD connections. So in particular that it's, it's a smooth manifold and it, it's not empty. Well, in particular, because it's not empty, you know, we just have the silly observation that the dimension is, is not negative, you know. So what does, what does that tell us, you know? So uh, if we, first of all, use our, our formula for the dimension, uh, this is from the previous slide, now we plug in this, what we call this basic lower bound, uh, which, which is here, uh, then we get this, this nice, uh, nice inequality. Uh, so that's, of course, the, the BMY inequality. 
So that that comes back to you know this this question that a hypothetical question that I posed earlier. You know, is there a way of using um, non-zero cyber Witten invariance to directly uh, imply that this moduli space is not empty when G is generic and you have this this positive lower bound? I should say, you know, some of you may wonder, well, you know, um, can the, you know, Witten's, you know, formula somehow, you know, provide insight into, into this question? And the, you know, the short answer is that it can. So this is a, a, a more, a more subtle question. So what we're going to try to do is to use um, virtual more spot theory to, you know, to prove existence um, of ASD connections. You know, uh, when this lower, so what we call this basic lower bound holds, uh, using the fact that we have a non-zero cyber witness invariant. All right, so up to this point, I haven't said what's, you know, what's the Morse function. Uh, so let me, let me introduce that. So the reason why we're interested in this so-called virtual Morse spot theory is because uh, this moduli space of SLT monopoles, even if a large chunk of it where the connections A are not reducible and the spinners are, um, are not identically zero, even though that's smooth, the cyber Witten points uh, are, are points which are, um, uh, which are not necessarily smooth points uh, of the moduli space. And as we've seen, there are also fixed points of uh, the circle action. Uh, and as we, we saw earlier when discussing uh, Frankel's theorem, there's, a, you know, there's a, a relationship between fixed points of circle actions and, and critical points of ha Hamiltonian functions. So I want to, excuse me, tie, this, tie these notions together. So Hitchens' uh, Morse function is, is, you know, is exactly the following. You know, the symbols in Hitchens' paper are all the same. They just mean something slightly different. You know? So in his paper in the 80s, um, the space MT is a moduli space of Higgs pairs, is a connection uh, on a rank two bundle over a Riemann surface in his case. Uh, and uh, for him, phi was a Higgs field, you know, for us, you know, phi is a, a spinner as we defined it earlier. So this is, um, uh, uh, you know, smooth on the smooth locus um, of the moduli space, but it, it's not necessarily uh, more spot. So as before, when we talked about Morse bot theory uh, on singular spaces, we're gonna call P a critical point um, if this differential is zero, not on the usual tangent space because you know, it, it may not be um, a smooth point, but on, on the Zariski tangent space. So the strategy is, um, is roughly the following. So we want to, to prove um, existence, first of all, of a, we want to know that we can create this moduli space of SO3 monopoles with certain properties. So that's what I mean here by you know, proving existence of a spin U structure with certain properties. I want to create a moduli space of SO3 monopoles uh, with, with the following setup. So first of all, uh, we want um, a situation where this Poincharagin number uh, is obeying this, this, uh, this so-called lower bound. Uh, and we also want that this moduli space of SOT monopoles, you know, that's interpolating, if you, if you will, between cyber witten model monopoles and anti cell tool connections, uh, that this is not empty. So once we have that set up, then the next thing we want to want to do is to, to prove that all critical points of Hitchens Morse function, that they are either ports and points in the anti cell dual moduli subspace or points in moduli sub subspaces um, of cyber Witten monopoles with, uh, with positive virtual Morse index. So when I was introducing virtual Morse spot index, uh, initially I emphasized a couple of times that the, the reason why positive virtual Morse spot index is important is this implies that that point is not a local minimum. And uh, I can kind of uh, go back to this picture again and, and kind of you know um, explain that idea a, a little bit more carefully, you know. So um, I, I draw this moduli sp space here of anti self dual connection. So it, it, it looks like it's the, you know, the, the absolute minimum of some height function. But this, of course, it is the absolute minimum of Hitchens Morse function because anti self dual connections occur precisely when the section fee is, is, is zero. So um, 
this modulized subspace here of anti self dual connections is, you know, is precisely the space of absolute minima uh, of Hitchens Morse function. Um, also, I, I've drawn these cyber Witten uh, moduli spaces here so that they, you know, at least visually, they, they look like there are points that have, you know, these positive Morse, Morse index or, or Morse bond index, you know, maybe virtual Morse bond index uh, more, more generally. So there are, you know, downward flow, uh, flowing gradient lines from each of these points, you know, none are local minima, that's the point. So our goal is to show that um, there's at least one of these moduli spaces, cyber width and moduli spaces with, with non-zero invariant in this setup. And if the only other critical points in this cyber in this uh, moduli space of SOC monopoles are either cyber width and moduli spaces with positive virtual Morse spot index or this moduli space of anti-self dual connections, then you can use Morse theory to tell you that uh, if you have non-vanishing cyber Witten invariants, you know, then you must this this uh, you must be able to attain this this absolute minimum. So, um, the, so the, the wrinkles that that arise when you try to you know apply this strategy to SOC monopoles rather than than Higgs pairs um, are, are are the following. So the the first thing that you have to wrestle with is that. Um, strata of cyber Witten monopoles um, are, are they're, they're, they're themselves are smooth manifolds, but they're not uh, they're not smoothly embedded. So, so this should say not submanifold, just say smooth manifold. They're not smoothly embedded submanifolds of the moduli space of anti-silicon connections. You know, by contrast, in in, in Hitchens' paper, um, his critical sets were smooth submanifolds, embedded submanifolds. Um, you know, second thing that you have to wrestle with is that the fact that the moduli space of SOC monopoles is non-compact due to energy bubbling, and how do you address that? So that that's a, a, another talk, um, uh, you know, for for the future. So Hitchens' um, assumptions that the degree of the vector bundle is odd and that its rank is two that that implies that his moduli space uh, is, is is a smooth is a smooth manifold. So his 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 um, his use of Morse bond theory, you know, is completely uh, is completely classical. Not I'm not saying that's not ingenious, but I'm, I'm just saying that um, he he doesn't need a sophisticated you know version of Morse theory like a stratified Morse theory in the sense of Goresky, Mark Pearson, or anything like that. All right, so the. I mentioned that the you know that one of the, the key things to do first is to show that you, you can create this moduli space of SOT monopoles uh, that has these nice um, properties to which you can then apply Morse theory. So um, uh, I'll just you know state a, a result that says that you know we we can do that. Um, so let's suppose we have a a standard four manifold. So this is one that you know just is, is well adapted to you know uh, defining cyber witten invariance and, and the definition of cyber witten simple type. Uh, it turns out to be a little bit gives us extra flexibility if rather than work with the four manifold itself, uh, we work with the, the blow. Um, and then if you do that, then you can find the following uh, the following situation. You can find a spin U structure as you need. In other words, you can find a space of S with the monopoles that contains this cyber Witten moduli subspace. Um, the uh, the moduli space of S with the monopoles, where the connection is not reducible, the section is is not identically zero. This is non-empty, so there is some potential for interpolating between cyber Witten monopoles and anti silk dual connections. Uh, and lastly, you have this uh, analog of this, what we call this basic lower bound for the first Pontiacian number being of eight. And uh, last but not least, um, if, you, uh, you, if you have any non-empty cyber Witten moduli subspace, then the, the virtual Morse bot index of the Hitchin function um, is, is positive. You know, so they're, in fact, they're, they're playing, the, they're, they, they cannot be local, local minima. Can you, uh, uh, can you say a little bit before you move forward? What are the? Uh, can you describe the, the, the spin structures? What? Uh, you're asking about the spin U structures. Yes. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So um, uh, let me just scroll back uh, a little bit. Um, there is simply uh, a direct sum of the ingredients that you need to to find anti-SL dual connections and, and, and cyber written monopoles. You know, so if there's a sign cyber written monopoles, uh, you need a spin C structure. Uh, so a Clifford multiplication map, uh, if you will, and, and a bundle, a rank four Hermitian bundle W that splits into you know positive, the bundle of positive spinners and negative spinners. So that's what you need for cyber written theory for to, to define anti self dual connections, you need a Hermitian uh, bundle E uh, of rank two or, or, or more. And a spin U structure is simply put those two structures together. That, that's all. Well, can you say maybe briefly what's the, like, what do you, what, what do you get out of the blow up? Because, you know, oftentimes, you know, in gauge theory, there's not a huge difference between what you see before and after blowing up. Um, uh, it's uh, it's simply it's um, uh, it makes it just a little bit easier to uh, let me scroll forward again. Sorry, uh, it, it simply just makes it a little bit easier to uh, achieve this this setup. You know, it's an equivalent setup. There's no loss of generality in doing it. Uh, it makes this theorem a little bit easier to prove. Okay. You, you have more freedom to pick the characteristic classes or with, with given values. Okay, yeah, I, I just somehow, well, I mean, I would have thought, well, I guess I haven't looked at it. So yeah, I'll, I'll take your word for it, of course. Okay, it's, um, it's a, I'll say that it's, it's a, it's something we, we do in pretty much all our papers on SO3 monopoles, uh, which is rather than work with the manifold itself, we, we work with the, uh, with the, with the blow up, you know? So that's, um, uh, it, it makes, um, if you want to make sure that, for example, you can, you can separate, you know, strata of anti self dual connections and cyber within moduli spaces, it makes that uh, cleaner. Um, and as Tom says, it, it gives you more flexibility in being able to, you know, ensure the decent equality as well. It's a, it's a somewhat technical point. I, I probably could have just suppressed it and, and uh, okay. So um, the next step in the, the program is we, we want to use Frankel's theorem and the, the version of Frankel's theorem that I, I stated um, was um, for, um, at least in, in, in the context of, of circle actions and, and virtual more spot theory, uh, is for, for complex uh, uh, Kähler manifolds and, and you know, um, analytic, complex analytic subspaces of them. So uh, I want to restrict just for the sake of, you know, exposition of any few minutes left anyway, to uh, the case where the four manifold X is actually just a complex Kähler surface. So there is a notion of Hitchin Kobayashi uh, correspondence that identifies SO3 monopoles with moduli spaces of stable, stable holomorphic pairs. So this goes back to um, you know various people. Ian Dalker, a student of uh, Peter Kronheimer, um, Talman, and, and his his collaborators uh, also. So this is a, a well uh, an analog of a, the well known uh, correspondence between anti self dual connections and, and stable stable bundles. You know. For example, in the work of um, Donaldson back in the back in the eighties, um, and and the value of, of that correspondence is that we can then think about the moduli space of SO3 monopoles as being a, a complex analytic space, and its its smooth points turn out to be um, uh, you have a complex manifold and in fact a complex Kähler Kähler manifold. So you have the the kind of setup that that you need in order to apply um, Frankel's theorem or a generalization you know, of Frankel's theorem. Um, and in, in that in that in that setting, uh, then you know critical points of Hitchin's function uh, correspond again to uh, fixed points uh, of the circle action. Uh, so in in that in that uh, in that setting, then uh, critical point critical points of Hitchin's Hamiltonian function. Uh, if you have a critical point of, of Hitchin's function uh, and the section phi is is not zero, then it's necessarily a Seiberg 
Britain monopole. So uh, you, you have this, this nice uh, fact that the critical points of the Hamiltonian function are, uh, are precisely uh, moduli subspaces of, of uh, uh, cyber Britain monopoles. All right, so let me sketch the remaining ideas um, in, in kind of two stages. You know, so first of all, let's suppose for the sake of argument that we have a cyber with uh, point and that it's a, actually a smooth point uh, of the moduli space. So it's a classical um, uh, Morse theory applies. So then <clears throat> what we would want to do is to, you know, first of all, show that the function f is Morse bot at this point and then Frankel's theorem can, can do that. Can, we can use Frank, appeal to Frankel's theorem to do that. Um, and then we would want to use Frankel's theorem to compute the Morse index of this function. Uh, in terms of the, um, the dimension of the, the negative weight space for the circle action uh, on the tangent space. So that's, um, so if we had a, if the cyber witten points were smooth points, we could just apply Frankel's theorem, uh, you know, essentially verbatim back from the, the, his uh, paper in the 1950s. And, you know, how would you actually, you know, compute this dimension? Well, it, it turns out that, uh, as in, in, in Hitchens' paper, these dimensions can be computed uh, using you know, uh, either Riemann-Rock or, or a T.S. Singer uh, index theorem more, more generally. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's the kind of calculation that Hitchens does in this paper. However, if, you, if the cyber witten point is, uh, is a singular point, uh, then you, you, can, you can still apply the uh, Riemann-Rock in, index theorem um, to compute uh, what we call a, a virtual Morse, uh, a virtual uh, Morse index, and, and the reasoning kind of goes as, as, as follows. You know. So the the description of a, an open neighborhood of a cyber witten point is it defined is just described by a Kuranishi model, and uh, Kuranishi model has you know three cohomology groups, if you will, um, a space H two, which is the Think about this being the obstruction to smoothness of space H1, which is the Zariski tangent space, and space uh, H0, which is the algebra uh, of the stabilizer. And for us, um, that's going to be zero. So I'm just putting it in for completeness that won't play a role. So um, this elliptic deformation complex uh, for a cyber witten point um, it splits naturally into, into two components. So first of all, there's a, a tangential deformation complex. And this is exactly the deformation complex, or at least equivalent to it, the deformation complex for the cyber witten moduli space. There is also a, a normal deformation complex, which is the complex uh, we're interested in. And that normal deformation complex, that further splits into a a positive weight subcomplex and a negative weight subcomplex, and we're interested in the negative weight subcomplex. So, if we had a, a point with uh, a cyber written smooth point, then the the only, only non-zero element of this complex would be precisely the um, uh, h1 minus uh, the dimension of the true tangent space in which the Hessian of Hitchens Morse function is negative definite, or the, uh, the negative weight space uh, for the circle action. However, um, because we have a, a complex here, we can still compute the, you know, the Euler characteristic of, of this uh, negative weight complex. And that, by definition, is, is, the, is, the, is the virtual Morse bond index. So we, we, get, the, we get, the following, uh, get the following result. So, if we have a, a cyber witten point, then the virtual Morse bot index, which is you know by definition is, is equal to, equal to this. So if we have a smooth point with no, this term here is actually zero. Uh, if we have a smooth point, then this term here will just disappear, and we'll have classical Morse bot index um, because we're not assuming the cyber witten point should be smooth. Uh, we we're using this concept of virtual Morse bot index, so we're computing the the or the characteristic of the full negative weight normal subcomplex. And it's, uh, it's equal to this quantity here. And it's this quantity which we can show to be uh, uh, positive. Uh, this is this quantity which we can show to be positive, uh, you know, as I mentioned in, in, in an earlier term. All right, so I'm, um, 
I apologize for rushing a little bit in the last uh, few slides, but uh, I think this is um, uh, a good place to stop. So thank you. Thank you all. Um, are there any questions for the speaker? Um, I have a, a question, please. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, well, one important thing or one additional feature of uh, the Higgs moduli space is that it's an integrable system as well. And um, sorry, you're talking about Hitchens moduli space, right? Or right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, the the fixed points of the circle action uh, fit in very well with the integrable system structure in the sense that the the fixed point set A corresponds to the zero fiber, or right. uh, what is called the global nilpotent cone, or basically Higgs fields which are uh, nilpotent. So I'm I'm wondering, um, do you have uh, so you had a really nice picture for uh, the Zyberg Witten uh, for, for well for the module SO3 moduli space for the fixed point set. Yeah. The do you have a similar picture for the moduli space of Higgs bundles? Um, uh, a similar. Uh, so I guess I had one picture back here. Uh, let me. Thirty-eight. Let me pull up the picture and just to make sure we're, is this one? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, so uh, uh, well, one of the problems in the Hitchin uh, system um, case was which Hitchin could not originally solve was to show that the dimension of uh, the zero fiber or this global nilpotent cone is exactly half the dimension of uh, the moduli space so that it is Lagrangian. He could show that it's co-isotropic, but that it's not Lagrangian. Right. So in that case, we know that the, the fixed point set at least uh, has half the dimension in right. the moduli space. So uh, I guess that's a little bit different from uh, this picture uh, for the moduli space of... Um, yeah, I, I, I think so. Uh, yeah, I mean, we um, we certainly don't show that for cyber witten moduli subspaces uh, in, in, our, in our paper. Yeah. And... Uh, but I so can do you know how many uh, connected components are there for uh, um, the fixed point set uh, in the Hitchin moduli space or Higgs bundles? Um, so I, I know very little about the moduli space of Higgs bundles. Um, um, uh, yeah, so you may know far more about that than, than I do. No, um, I can yeah. tell you a little bit about SLC monopoles, but. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I my my knowledge of Higgs bundles is is, is cursory. There are just you know certain uh, features of, of Hitchin's paper that I you know we, we chose to adapt, and, and those I'm familiar with. I see. Uh, I was uh, reading uh, comments, uh, but a, by I mean just to so there is an uh, interesting case for Higgs bundles where the moduli space um, uh, has singularities. Mm -hmm. and that's, uh, so, for example, for rank two, you uh, also require that the determinant of the rank two bundle is fixed and let's say trivial. In this case, the locus of, uh, uh, so in this case, there is a singular locus of uh, Higgs bundles and the singular locus uh, it corresponds exactly to those Higgs bundles, which are uh, strictly semi-stable. So that is, they have a, a line sub bundle with the right. slope equal to that one. Right. But I think that the co-dimension of the singular set is uh, bigger than two. Uh, Hitchin uses this uh, fact, I think, I don't know, I forget what it's called, the uh, Hodge's theorem or Hodge's criteria to say that if the singular locus has co-dimension bigger than two, then all uh, analytic functions extend to the singular locus as well. Yeah. Um... But the point was, there is a case of Higgs bundles where uh, there is a singular locus as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the point I was making is that uh, even, you know, um, without talking about stable or semi-stable bundles, that if we, in, in the case of Higgs, if we drop the condition that the rank of the, of the bundle E and its uh, degree are co-prime, uh, then I think those moduli spaces are um, 
or can generally be, you know, singular. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, right, yeah, I mean, even if, uh, yeah, so when the rank and degree are not uh, co-prime, um, the singularity locus is precisely uh, bundles uh, which are uh, strictly semi-stable. Mm -hmm. So that's right. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Paul? Yeah. <clears throat> Does, so what, from what you told us sort of towards the end, I, I got a little uh, lost because things went, started, started speeding yeah, up. Yeah. But when you told us at the end, does that essentially constitute, can you extract from that a, a, a somewhat new proof of, of the BMY inequality, in, at least in the Kaler case? Well, yeah, so that's something that um, Richard Wenther, Tom and I are, are uh, exploring. Um, so it's, um, if you restrict your attention to, I mean, this is obviously not our ultimate goal, but if you restrict your attention to the case where the X is a complex Kähler surface, then, um, uh, you know, you can consider the, you know, the Giesier or compactification of your moduli space. Um, and uh, you, you could, you should be able to then give a you know, a, a gauge theory proof, if you will, of the BMY inequality, you know, but it would be, you know, more complicated uh, by a wide margin than Yao's original proof for Miyoka's, but, um, you know, it would be insightful, I, I think. Yeah. So, I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't have thought Yao's was so simple. But. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I guess it's a, it's a question of, uh, yeah, matter, maybe a matter of taste, you know, you know, you know. But the issue of extending that proof to sort of a general standard four manifold with non-zero cyber widen would be the compactness and bubbling issues or? Yeah, um, there, there are a couple of issues. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's mainly the, the compactness issue, you know, so, um, you know, there is a, a version of the Frankel's theorem that we, we use in virtual Morse bot theory and so on uh, that applies when the four manifold is, is, is only um, almost complex. Uh, so that, that's, that's fine. The, the, the main issue is, is uh, you know, dealing with cyber width and moduli spaces that occur in, in, in the compactification. You know, that, um, so um, moduli spaces of cyber width and monopoles in the presence of bubbling. So computing, you, you have to be able to compute not just the Morse bot index um, of a a cyber width and moduli space where there's no bubbling around there, but you, you also have to compute um, contributions from the you know the ideal boundary of the moduli space. So, um, in a nutshell, yeah, bubbling um, causes complications. And if you restrict yourself to the complex algebraic category, you have more tools to, to work with there. Anyone else? Um, Could you shortly um, say in what uh, in what meaning the uh, U1 Zeibach-Witten moduli space are smooth? Because uh, you say that as um, as subsets, sub varieties of this big configuration space of SO Freeman um, configurations, they're they're singular. But on the other hand, in some sense, they are smooth. So, what's uh, where is this dichotomy coming from? Um, sorry, are, are, you, um, are you are are you asking specifically about the cyber witten moduli spaces and their relationship between this with this larger moduli space? Yes, yes. So you you said that okay, these, the, these uh, are smooth, but. Um, Okay, all right. On well, their own, but not as sub uh, subsets of this whole. Uh, yeah, precisely. Area. Yeah, so um, um, you, you can think about this moduli space of SOT monopoles as a you know a disjoint union of, of three pieces. You know, so first of all, we have this um, subspace of anti-soul dual connections. So by itself, you know, as a um, without considering it as a, a subspace of the moduli space of SOC monopoles, you know, the moduli space of anti-cell tool connections is a smooth manifold, um, you know, in the situation, in, in the um, uh, setup we are considering where the Romanian metric is, is generic. You know. 
um, b plus odd and, and bigger than uh, three and, and so on. Um, but it's nonetheless, it's, it's not necessarily a smooth submanifold of the moduli space of SOT mon mon uh, embedded submanifolds of the moduli space of SOT monopoles. You know, similarly, um, each of these cyber Witten moduli spaces for a generic geometric parameters, which you use to perturb the cyber Witten equations, uh, those themselves are smooth manifolds, but they're, they're not necessarily smooth submanifolds of the moduli space of SOT monopoles. That's the, um, you know, those are the distinctions that I, I was drawing. Is that, um, is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understood the statement. I just wondered if you could say a word about where this fact comes from. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, so the, well, let me explain maybe the reason, reason for it, you know, so there is a, an old result due to version due to Talman and myself from the um, 90s that uh, if you take the moduli space of SLT monopoles, if you assume uh, that the connections A are, are irreducible and that the sections, the spinners phi are, are not zero, uh, then you can prove that 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 what you're left with, that, that moduli subspace uh, is, a, is a smooth manifold. But the, the, the proof of smoothness only works away from where the connections are, are, are reducible and away from where the, um, the spinners are, are identically zero. So the proof you know, breaks down at SO3 monopoles where the connection A is reducible, that those correspond to cyber Witten points or when the section phi is identically zero uh, those correspond to um, these anti self dual points here. So they, you know, it, it might happen that they, they could be smooth points. You know, th these obstruction spaces H2 could potentially vanish there. You know? But uh, you, you, in, in general, you just can't show that, you know. Oh, okay. So it's yeah. like the, this, these smaller moduli spaces are smooth, uh, but the, the big SO3 moduli space around them is not necessarily. Um, no, the, the other way around. So the, um, the, so these, um, these points which I've labeled the cyber written moduli spaces and the anti self dual moduli yeah. space, you know, intrinsically they're smooth manifolds that they're, they're mm -hmm. just not embedded smooth manifolds of this uh, larger moduli space. On the other hand, if you look at the, the complement of these, of these points, um, the complement of the cyber Witten points and the complement of the um, anti self dual, dual points, what you're left with, that is a smooth manifold. Sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, if uh, there aren't any more questions, let's thank Paul again. Thank, thank you all for coming. Thank you. And Paul, if you email me your slides, I will post them with a video on the GTV site. Okay, sure. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, I'll, I'll email them to you right now. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody's right. I should say that uh, maybe just to mention that the at the in the appendix, um, uh, I give a bunch of uh, we have a bunch of pictures there that try to explain using simple examples, you know, what this virtual Morse bot theory buys you, you know, so, um, you know, right. the examples are simple, but they, I think they convey the, the flavor better than, you know, some of the more technical statements. In Do you want to take an extra two or three minutes to show them? I mean, is it? Uh... Uh, sure, if you, if you like, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yep. Yeah. I'm interested. Okay, all right. Um, You know, they are, I will just warn you that they're, they're bad pictures. They're the best that I could come up with on an iPad. I don't use Inkscape or, you know, the kind of fancy programs that many of you use to draw the beautiful pictures that appear in your papers. <laughs> uh, apologies in advance for that, you know. Um, so here, I'm just starting with something basically just explaining 
um, what you know what we mean by stable and unstable manifolds. So um, you know, are there other critical points so we can uh, maybe skip that? Um, one of the points that turns out to be um, important is to you know remember that um, you know there are large open neighborhoods of the either the stable or unstable manifolds uh, where um, uh, a, you know a given uh, Morse function um, you know is either uh, bigger than or is either, is either greater than or, or, or below you know its value at the critical point you know. uh, and that simple observation just turns out to be um, important uh, in the proof of um, uh, our virtual Morse spot index theorems. Uh, I'm just you know illustrating that again in this uh, in this kind of you know naive picture. All right, so let me move to an example where we're trying to apply um, Morse bot theory to a singular point of a, of a surface. So I'm just taking the single, simplest singularity of all, you know, quadratic cone, um, uh, where this is the, you know, singular point. Um, and uh, I, I don't, I should have made an explicit choice of, you know, Morse function f, I, I didn't. Um, uh, I'm just taking some function f, which happens to have a critical point uh, at the origin, uh, where the you know Zariski tangent space is is, is three space, uh, and the co coherent of this uh, I didn't give the local defining function a name, but it's it's basically this expression here. Uh, the co coherent of that critical point is is just the real. It's, it's one dimensional. All right. So the first thing. We, we do, one might think about doing is, is applying resolution of singularities. And, uh, you know, some of you are familiar with the terminology there, maybe some not, can you, but you- Can you go back once, go back to that one? Cause I'm just sort of, so I'm thinking, am, am I got the right picture? If I think of in this case, um, the function F to be in your notations, like X one squared or something like that, or is that not? Uh, here, uh, yeah, x x one squared, yeah. No, 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 no. Is is the, I'm thinking what the, you didn't name the function f. I didn't name the function f. No, I I, I, didn't, I didn't I didn't say what f was. You know, and it's important in this picture to not think about it as being a height function. It's it's um, uh, you know, think about it as being a function defined in three dimensional space. You know. Yeah. I, so I was asking whether uh, the function x one f of x one x two x three is x one squared. Uh, that is that expression is defining the capital F here. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm asking whether little f could be taken to be just the function x one little x one squared. Um, I'm just trying to get an, uh, something to have in, in mind. Yeah, you 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 could. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I should pro I should I, I should redo these examples that I'm going to uh, explain um, using a specific choice of, of f. I I, I didn't okay. right. uh, I just as I said. Uh, just yeah. trying to get some motion. Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, all right. So um, the first thing it's helpful to do is to, you know, use, um, uh, is to blow up. Uh, and then we get um, uh, a so-called uh, strict transform um, X prime, uh, which is which is smooth to just, the, you know, the cylinder in, in this picture. Uh, we got an exceptional divisor E prime um, uh, on this point, P prime, uh, which, which is here. And you can realize this resolution using, you know, using those substitutions. All right, so let's suppose for the sake of argument that again, I, I, I didn't choose a function little f. I, I should have, and, and I'll maybe revise, we'll revise these pictures with, with a choice. Yeah. But let's suppose that, um, uh, the function little f has a, you know, a two-dimensional uh, subspace um, here uh, on which the, you know, the, its Hessian is, is negative definite. Now, I, I've drawn this two-dimensional subspace here in, in kind of general position with respect to the exceptional divisor, you know, um, and that's, that's on, on, on purpose. Uh, and you can see that in, in doing that, there is a, this negative weight uh, negative subspace, if, if you will, it, it intersects the, the strict transform in, in a curve, you know, uh, called, you know, called C prime, you know. 
So this is potentially a, a downward flowing, uh, flowing direction. Now, you know, when, when could be unlucky and have a situation where this two dimensional subspace actually is coplanar with the exceptional divisor. So when you kind of blow down the potential for downward, uh, downward gradient flow is just lost because it's, you know, the, the downward flowing directions are just swallowed up in, into, into this uh, single, singular point. You know. um, so the reason that I've drawn this, uh, this negative subspace as being in general position with respect to the exceptional divisor is that um, even if it happens to be coplanar, one might think about, um, you know, a, a nearby plane uh, which does intersect X prime nicely and, and defines downward uh, gradient flow uh, and in, um, away from the, um, uh, the locus, which is blown down to a point. So in this, in this example, the, what's called, you know, the virtual Morse index is the dimension of this uh, negative subspace minus the dimension of the co-kernel. Um, so this is equal to one. So this is a situation where, you know, the, uh, the virtual Morse index uh, is equal to one. And when you, go, when you go back down to the original singular space, you know, there is a, a curve, see this green curve, which is, you know, potentially containing uh, lower um, uh, points with, with smaller um, value of the, um, uh, the, the Morse function, Morse function F. Um, the other thing to contrast with this is you might ask, well, what happens if the virtual Moore sound index is equal to zero? You know, so this is a picture where the, the, the negative subspace is actually one dimensional. Uh, and it's, it's, again, it's in general position with respect to the, you know, exceptional divisor, uh, but it, you know, it, it just it, it intersects this strict transform with a single point. So when you, when you blow down, uh, you know, there, there may be in the three-dimensional manifold, there may be potentially downward flowing directions, uh, but the, not uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, um, in the original, you know, singular, uh, singular um, the manifold X. So, the, um, so what these two pictures are trying to illustrate are that virtual Morse index equal to one um, gives rise to uh, downward uh, points which are, um, it, it, they allow you to show that the, the singular, even though the point is singular, that it's not a local minimum. Uh, whereas if the virtual Morse index is, is, is zero, um, you, you, sorry, you, you lose that ability to show that the, um, uh, the virtual Morse index is equal to, um, is equal to, I seem to have lost this picture for some reason. Yeah, you, you lose the ability to show that the virtual Morse index um, sorry, that the, the point P is, 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 uh, is, is not a local minimum. So it was the point of view, so at some point you've made some assumptions about, I don't know, you made about you know, some inequalities of, of dimensions. Is that somehow to put you in the, you know, get out of this situation where you had this uh, too low a virtual Morse index? Yeah, so the, um, uh, yeah, so what, what, the, what we show in the, um, you know, in the results I described earlier is that when we apply this kind of, these kind of reasoning to um, cyber witten moduli spaces um, uh, in the setup that seems appropriate for proving the Bo Bo bogomolov miyoka yao inequality, uh, the virtual Morse index is always, of those cyber witten points is always positive. You know. um, uh, so, um, you know, there are never local, local minima and, and gradient flow for the Hitchin function never gets trapped at a cyber Witten point. It, it can continue flowing down to, you know, a, an anti self fill connection. Does that uh, help or? Um... Well, I think the pictures are great, so yeah. Okay, right. Thanks. Well, I don't, Nikolai, what do you think? Should we, should we, maybe we should wrap it up here. <laughs> uh, I'm waiting for Dave to say something. But, oh, uh, I, 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 I think it's wonderful. Thanks for showing the picture. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Okay, thank you. All right, well, nice to see you. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh,
Thanks a lot, hope to see you in real life next year. Uh, and thanks again for the invitation. You know, thanks for the questions. Yeah. Sure. All right. And we'll send information out when we start up again in January. Wonderful. Look forward to it. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.